she's and she's stuck at home at the moment like everyone so she's a great person to do that with awesome so um thank you so much we're going live now ah exciting uh, we're starting here in the left uh corner you will hear, see the the direct link to the stream on youtube if anyone else wants to join but uh first of all thank you so much johan for joining this call it really is a pleasure and uh, for those of you who do not know, uh, just a very short introduction, Johan Hari here is a journalist and a writer, New York, Beth, New York Times best-selling author of uh, a couple of books, two very, very amazing books that I can recommend. It's Chasing the Scream, which we'll be talking about today, uh, which gives one of the best, uh, both historical and kind of current affairs narrative of what is happening with the drug war, why drug war is uh, failing us, and we will hear uh, a lot more about it in the, in the minutes to come. And the, the latest book is called Lost Connections, uh, right? So maybe, yeah. uh, maybe we should start off with that. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about Lost Connections? And oh, I just want to say I really admire the work that you're doing. I think it's so important. And you're fighting this fight in a situation that's particularly challenging, kind of social situation that's particularly challenging. So I really admire you, Alexander, and the work that all of you guys are doing um yeah a lost connections is really a book about um why there's been a big increase in depression and anxiety throughout my lifetime and what we can what we can do about it uh i've been talking about that a lot depression anxiety a lot since the quarantine began so i'm so happy to talk about the drug war with you because i feel like, yeah i get to go back to my greatest hits right uh and uh i've you know i've been there's lots of reasons to be anxious about the drug war at the moment and some reasons to be encouraged so i'm really excited to talk to you about that Awesome. Yeah, I was I was gonna say this. This is really a time where lost connections would, is is a very handy book, uh, keeping in mind the the consequences for the uh, of the last couple of weeks. You know, it's it's, it's a strange it. thing, isn't it? Because uh, part of what I learned for that book, obviously, I spent three years researching it and interviewing kind of the leading experts in the world about depression. And a big part of what I learned for that book is, you know, most pe when I was a teenager, I went to my doctor with terrible depression and my doctor told me a story that was entirely biological um i was just told you know oh we know why people get like this they just have a problem in their brain some people just have a chemical imbalance you're clearly one of them all we need to do is drug you and so i started taking a chemical antidepressant which gave me some relief for a while but um you know i remained mostly depressed for a long time and i was taking more and more higher and higher doses and and Actually, when I went on this big long journey and interviewed the leading experts in the world, I, I discovered that I learned that there, there is some biological contribution to depression. It's very important to stress that. But actually, most of the causes of depression and anxiety are not factors in our biology. They're factors in the way we're living. And I remember when my book first came out, uh, some people reacted to that as, as a very controversial point. Um, and most people didn't, but some, uh, not least because it's the position of the World Health Organization, the leading medical body in the world, so it shouldn't be controversial. But some people did, who, you know, for reasons that I understand, who are very committed to a, a heavily biological story about their pain. And one of the things that's been interesting to see and get emails about over the last few weeks has been, you know, there's, everyone agrees there's been a big increase in depression and anxiety over the last three weeks, right? And nobody claims that what happened in the last three weeks is there was some sudden mutation in human biology, right? What happened is our environment changed uh, in certain very obvious ways that have caused an increase in depression and anxiety. And they're pretty, when you get down to it, they're pretty obvious things. Loneliness causes depression and anxiety. Financial insecurity, causes depression and anxiety i could go on about that and i think one of the few good things that could come from this terrible catastrophe that's happening to all of us is the fact that depression has risen in the last month because of environmental factors should get us to ask okay well what environmental factors were changing over the past 30 years that were themselves causing an increase in depression and anxiety and when we get out of this how can we finally listen to the advice of the World Health Organization and build most of our responses to this, to this crisis of depression and anxiety around dealing with those underlying problems? And that kind of the last third of my book, Lost Connections, is people all over the world, doctors, scientists, communities, I got to know, who were actually doing that, who are actually dealing with the underlying causes of depression and having incredible results. So to me, it's a very hopeful thing. That's a hopeful thing that might come out of... Uh, out of this disaster to explain to people if you're depressed and anxious in this crisis you're not weak you're not crazy you're not a machine with broken parts you know you're a human being with basic needs that aren't being met at the moment and it's 
totally understandable you feel this way your pain makes sense and together we can find ways to deal with that pain and that, that's an excellent point and i think one of the one of the kind of examples that you have been using in the past that i really loved and uh kind of connecting it to to uh, chasing this cream is in particular the example of red park right where the example of uh, and I, I think you put it very well that the opposite of, uh, of addiction is not sobriety, but it's connection, right? Connectivity. So can you tell us a little bit more about that? Why these things are so important? And uh, I, I think you have written about it very well in, in your book. So can you share some of these thoughts and maybe the, the Rat Park experiment for those of you, for those of the people who do not know what it is? I love Rat Park and I've recently learned a detail about Rat Park that I can tell you could be the first person I've ever disclosed this to. So, um, yeah, I mean, this, it really changed my life and my understanding of myself and my family when I learned about this. So I guess the way I would set it up is to explain that, you know, everyone watching knows that you have natural physical needs, right? Obviously, you need food, you need water, you need shelter, you need clean air, you need exercise. If I took those things away from you, you'd be in you know, trouble really quickly. But there's equally strong evidence that all human beings have natural psychological needs. You need to feel you belong. You need to feel your life has meaning and purpose. You need to feel that people see you and value you. You need to feel you've got a future that makes sense. And this culture that we've built is good at lots of things. And I'm glad to be alive today, right? I love Netflix and gay marriage, you know, right? Like lots of things are much better than in, in the past. But we've been getting less and less good at meeting these deep underlying psychological needs for many people, not everyone. And this is a key reason, a, a key driver of the, the parallel epidemics of addiction, depression and anxiety that we're seeing across the Western world. And I could talk more about that, um, more about that if you like, but to, to go to Rat Park, which is really what led me into these insights. So, and, and the completely incredible human being who, who taught me about this. So I had a story in my head from when I was a small child, actually, about what addiction was that I kind of took for granted and certainly believe, right? We had addiction in my family. And one of my earliest memories is of trying to um, wake up one of my relatives and, and not being able to. And I didn't understand um, what was going on then because I was only a small boy. But obviously, as I got older, I understood more. And I thought for most of my life, if you'd said to me, what causes, for example, heroin addiction, right? So heroin addiction, because something was close to me. If you'd said to me, what causes heroin addiction, I would look at you like you're an idiot. I would have said, well, the clue's in the name, right? <laughs> obviously heroin causes heroin addiction. We've been told this story for 100 years that's become part of our common sense and is a key underpinner of the, the drug war, right? So we think, uh, if I kidnapped, I'm just talking to you from London, you're in Serbia, if either of us kidnapped the next 20 people to walk past our houses, and like a villain in a Saw movie, we, we injected them all with heroin every day for a month, at the end of that month, they'd all be heroin addicts for a simple reason. There are chemical hooks in heroin that their bodies would start to desperately physically crave and need. Um, and, and at the end of that month, they'd have this tremendous physical hunger for the drug. And that's what addiction is, right? That's, that's what I believed. Um, you know, it's why we call it being hooked, right? <laughs> You're exposed to chemical hooks and they take you over. The first thing that alerted me to the fact there's something not right about that story is when it was explained to me by doctors here in Britain. In Britain, if, you know, if I step out into the street after I've talked to you, uh, which I won't because I'm not allowed to, but <laughs> if I could, and I got hit by a truck um, and I got taken to hospital for a broken hip, say, I'd be given loads of a drug called, likely be given loads of a drug for the pain, for pain relief called diamorphine, right? Diamorphine is heroin. It's much better heroin than I could score on the streets because it's medically pure heroin, right? Some people in British hospitals are given um, this medically pure heroin for quite long periods of time, right? If anyone watching this has a British grandmother who's had a hip replacement operation, your grandmother's taken lots of heroin, right? If what we think about addiction is right, that it's caused primarily or entirely by exposure to the chemical hooks, what should be happening to all these grandmothers in British hospitals? Significant numbers of them should be becoming addicted. They should be leaving, trying to score on the streets. This has been studied. It never happens, right? And I remember when I learned that, just thinking, well, that can't be true. It doesn't make sense, right? How could you have a situation where you have someone in a hospital bed be giving lots of, you know, really potent medical heroin and they don't become addicted and you have someone in the alleyway outside shooting up 
using actually a weaker, shittier form of the drug and they do become addicted. How can that be? And I only began to understand it when I went to Vancouver and interviewed an incredible man named Bruce Alexander, who's a professor there. And Professor Alexander explained to me this, this theory that we have that, you know, addiction is caused by exposure solely to the chemical hooks comes from a series of experiments that were done earlier in the 20th century. They're really simple experiments. Your viewers can try them at home if they're feeling a little bit mean. You take a rat, you put it in a cage and you give it two water bottles. One is just water and the other is water laced with either heroin or cocaine. If you do that, the rat will almost always prefer the drugged water and almost always kill itself by overdose quite quickly. If anyone wants to see something funny, look up the Partnership for Drug-Free America advertisement from the 1980s that showed this experiment and basically says at the end, it will happen to you. Um, so, but in the 70s, actually before that advert, so they should have known better, Professor Alexander came along and said, looked at these experiments. He was working with people with addiction problems in Vancouver. And he was like, well, hang on a minute. You put the rat alone in an empty cage. It's got nothing to do except use these drugs. What would happen if we did this differently? So um, he built a cage called Rat Park, which is basically like heaven for rats, right? They've got loads of friends. They can have loads of cheese. They've got loads of colored balls. They can have loads of sex. Anything a rat can want in life is there in Rat Park. And they've got both the water bottles, the normal water and the drugged water. And of course, they try both. This is the fascinating thing. In Rat Park, they don't like the drug water that much. None of them use it compulsively. None of them ever overdose. So you go from almost 100% compulsive use and overdose when they don't have the things that make life meaningful for rats to no compulsive use and overdose when they do have the things that make life meaningful to rats. And there's loads of kind of human examples. But I think this teaches us something about connection, which is not just social connection. We can talk about more of what we mean by that. And you see that today with the opioid crisis, which has been profoundly misrepresented across the world. Big opioid crisis in the United States, one of the biggest killers in the US, now been overtaken by coronavirus, obviously, but was the biggest killer along with car accidents. Um, well, I mean, there's some debate about that, but close to the top anyway. Um, and people have said, oh, look, people have applied the chemical hook story. Well, look what happened. These evil drug dealers gave people this uniquely potent drug and it took them over. It's not true. Look at what the, look at Professor Ann Case and um, Professor Angus Dayton, who've done the best work on this. Where are the opioid deaths happening? They're not happening on the faculty at Harvard, where people have much better access to prescription opioids. They're happening in places like West Virginia. Why is that? You don't have to spend long in West Virginia to see why, right? People have been stripped of the things that make life meaningful. They, through no fault of their own, they've been humiliated, they've been beaten down. You know, opioid deaths are highest at the places where non-opioid based suicides are highest, where, you know, antidepressant prescriptions are highest. Why would that be if it was just about exposure to drugs? Clearly it's about misery. That's why Professor Angus Dayton and Anne Case call them deaths of despair, right? So we've got to understand that, and anyway, just to the last thought on that is that, it, and it really relates to the amazing work that you guys do, it helps you to see it's yet another reason why the drug war is such a disaster, right? Because the drug war is premised on the idea, if someone's got an addiction problem, we need to impose suffering and pain on them to give them an incentive to stop. When I was in Sao Paulo, the official police operation to go and beat up the people with addiction problems on the street was called Operation Pain and Suffering. But once you understand that pain is the driver of addiction, right? The core of addiction is about not wanting to be present in your life because your life's too painful a place to be. Once you understand that, you can see that inflicting pain on people, you know, sometimes people say oh, it doesn't work. The truth is much worse than that. It's not that it doesn't work, it's that it makes the problem worse, you know? Um, and, and that's another reason why what the work you're doing is so important. Thank, thank you so much for that. I mean, one of the things that really stood out for me, and I know I have been mentioning uh, how much I love the book uh, uh, more than a few times. Oh, thank one you. Thing that, that, that did it really well for me is that it, there's a few stories, fewer, I, I'll be very honest, horrifying, but that actually um, illustrate very well how some of this uh, punishment is not, not only working, but it's in some, uh, some uh, aspects definitely inhumane even. So uh, one, one of the examples that probably struck me the most and that, uh, that uh, I, I felt very, very strongly about was the case of Marcia Powell, uh, which you have been describing for the uh, case from the Arizona, Arizona prison institution. I think um, that if, if you can maybe share a little bit 
on that because I think that is one of the most most horrifying examples of people when they see um, the state policing people who use uh, use substances they almost never think of um, of the results that would look something 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 like this. I think that's such a I'm glad you asked me about that because I don't get asked about that case that often and it's so I just remembered one thing I, I said I would tell you a detail about Rat Park that I've not told anyone and I forgot to do it which is um, someone told me they'd asked Bruce, uh, Bruce Alexander, who did the experiment this, and I asked him if it was true, and it is. I, I didn't think to ask him this when I interviewed him a lot for the book. Someone said to him, all the rats from Rat Park, and the, uh, what did you do when the experiment was over? What happened to them? And he said, I took them out into the, the mountains and I let them all go, I let them all go free. And there's something I really love about that, because it's almost like that is an experiment that has set so many people free to understand their own addiction in a better way. And I love the idea that the rats themselves, having had this perfectly healthy relationship with heroin, then go off and live these free lives. But um, to talk about Marsha, I mean, this is, a, um, I think about her a lot. So I went to Arizona um, when I was researching Chasing the Screen because there was a, so the man who launched the war on drugs is a terrible human being called Harry Anslinger, who we might talk about. And um, the book really opens with the story of how he stalked and killed Billy Holiday, the great jazz singer. And I knew that there was this man, a particularly terrible human being, who was in charge of Maricopa County. He was the sheriff, he's called Joe Arpaio, Sheriff Joe. And he was in charge of the prison system in Maricopa County, jail system. So I knew I wanted to go and talk to him, but I didn't really have a sense of the stories I wanted to get in Arizona. So one of the first people I spoke to was a woman called Donna Leone Ham, who runs a group called Middle Ground Prison Reform. She's one of the only people in the state who does anything to monitor abuses against prisoners. And I went to see Donna and, and I said to her, what I often say to people when I turn up in a new place, I'm looking for stories. I said, tell me about something that shocked you in the work you've done. And so Donna was listing a load of terrible stories and ninth or 10th, she said, there was the time they put that woman in a cage and cooked her, that was quite bad. And then she carried on and I sort of said, sorry, Donna, can you, can you go back a second? What was the thing you just said? Anyway, there was a woman called Marsha Powell. It was a woman in her early forties who kept being arrested either for having meth or for prostituting herself to get meth or crack. It, it kind of evolved over the, the years. Um, and she was a very severely addicted woman. Um, and when she was arrested, you see from the police report, she was actually in a state of psychosis. She thinks that Jay-Z is trying to kill her. She was very, very unwell. And anyway, the last time she was busted, it was on the most ludicrous charge. So she gave a guy a blowjob in an alleyway for money. And a 13 or 14 year old boy walked into the alleyway uh, and she was charged with child molestation offences because a 14-year-old boy had seen her give a man a blowjob. It was bizarre. So she was given a long prison sentence. And one morning she woke up in Estrella Prison in, in, in Arizona and she was suicidal. She was smashing her head against the wall. And the psychiatrist on duty said that she should be taken and put into... Uh, uh, um, just to shut her up really, put into a, a holding cell. Now these holding cells, bear in mind Arizona is the desert, it's very hot. You can't stay, I can't stay out. I mean, I'm a ludicrously pale white person with Scottish ancestry, so I can't stay outside in that for 10 minutes, right? So this is a, a holding cell, which by law in Arizona, it can be used to check people into the prison, but you're not allowed to keep people there for more than 45 minutes because it's just an exposed cage in the desert. There's no shade or anything. She was put in this cage, Marsha, suicidal, screaming. And what happened next is contested. So the prison guards say that they forgot she was there. That doesn't seem plausible if you look at a plan of the prison, they weren't very far away. Uh, what the other prisoners, including some that I spoke to, say is that she screamed and begged for help and they mocked her and jeered at her. After that, what has happened is not disputed, which is that she collapsed after being in that cage for more than 12 hours in the burning sun. An ambulance was called. By the time the ambulance arrived, her, her eyeballs had dried out. She was so severely burned. She was taken to hospital and she died that, that night. And 
when I started looking into this, there had been, you know, um, very, very little that nothing really was known about Marsha Powell. There was a wonderful at local activist named Peggy, P Peggy Plews. It's a friend of mine who had tried to do some digging, but it had been really hard. So we ended up being able to, I ended up being able to, I managed to track down her former partner. I pieced together her life. You know, this is a woman who'd endured the most terrible suffering. She was adopted when she was 13. Her adopted mother threw her out on the street. So she ended up living with this biker guy. She lived on the beach for a long time on her own when she was a child. And then she ended up when she was 16 with this biker gang that dreadfully abused her. She had some moments of real happiness. She loved gold panning out in the, um, in the rivers. She, she had moments of real stability and joy. Um, actually, it was a period when she got together with a man. She really got her life together. She was in recovery and she got busted for an old drug offence, actually a cannabis possession offence. And she got sent back to prison and her whole life fell apart again. And she's put on this terrible trajectory. And I think about Marsha Powell, like I think about Billie Holiday and so many people, including some people I love. I just think when you when I learned her story, when I sat with her husband, when I spoke to her friends, just thought how many times this woman needed and deserved someone to intervene and help her. And how many points along the way, the money that the state used to persecute and destroy and kill her could have been used to help her, right? That money could be used to help the 13 year olds who are sleeping on the fucking beach right, who've been sexually abused. It could have been helped at every stage when she was picked up by the police and she was in a state of psychosis and she believed that Jay-Z and Beyonce were trying to kill her. That might have been a good time for an investment in, you know, mental health services, love and care protection, giving this woman the support she needed. Instead, it's all spent to destroy her, beat her down, break her down and eventually kill her. And one of the things that was... Um, you know, it was really hard for me because not long after I went to Arizona, I went to Portugal and Switzerland, where they, instead of spending the money on fucking people up and destroying them, they spend their money after having decriminalized or legalized, uh, and we can talk about the difference, um, on loving people and helping them turn their lives around, right? And I thought about, God, if Marshall Powell had been Portuguese or Swiss, it would never have come to this. And it's worth just saying one last thing about Marshall Powell, which is that no one was ever criminally punished for what happened to her. A few of the guards were fired, but no one was ever held criminally responsible for what should rightly be regarded as a brazen murder of this woman, or at the very least manslaughter. Absolutely. I mean, that, that is one of the, the most, most horrifying stories. And it also does a very good job in kind of everyone being able to at least to some level identify and think at least no one deserves this. That and I remember going out with, you know, Sheriff Joe, um, he himself is a very disturbed person who actually deserves compassion. He's a really deranged person. Um, maybe that's a sign of what a wet liberal I am, that I even regard my enemies as people who deserve like compassion. But um, the Sheriff Joe has this prison he runs where he um, is actually no longer there, fortunately, because he subsequently lost office. Uh, he was due himself to go to prison for racist... Um, criminality but uh trump pardoned him but he had this prison at the time where women were made to go out on chain gangs wearing t-shirts saying i was a drug addict while members of the public mock them and jeer at them and i remember going out with these women and one of the things that was so disturbing was um you know it was this kind of pantomime of cruelty and these women were met, forced to do these kind of recantations you know i know i deserve to be here i know i'm a bad person these people who were like had the most severe addiction problems you can imagine. Um, and the minute I kind of said to them, well, I don't think you deserve to be here. You don't have to say that to me. There was just this relief on their faces, you know, like, so it was very, very disturbing. I th oh, you're breaking up a bit there. Can you hear me? I think it's uh, the most important kind of, part of, uh, of the book is actually explaining Harry Anslinger and uh, his, his uh, motives, his work, and so on. Um, and sometimes, uh, first, I mean, it would be really great because I, I know you have mentioned him and the story with him and Billy Holiday is, is I, think, I think, also way less known than it should be. 
But I, I sometimes wonder, and maybe that's something that you might want to speculate in a sentence or two, is what would uh, Harry Anslinger think of all this? Would he be proud or did he think it, it, we're still not doing enough? But, <laughs> that's um, such a good question. I, I think, <laughs> thanks. I mean, he's definitely one of the people that are, are not known enough as in the way that they should be, because everyone knows uh, Nixon and the drug war. No, everyone knows Just Say No campaign, but Harry Anslinger is not a known person as, uh, as, as a person who has brought so much suffering. He's about to become much better known because I'm very excited to say it's I've seen the rough cut, uh, the film adaptation of my book uh, directed by Lee Daniels, who won the Oscar for the Butler, he directed Precious, uh, has Harry Anslinger absolutely at its heart. So a lot more people are going to know Harry Anslinger's name very soon. But you're totally right. Anslinger is the most influential person who no one's ever heard of. Um, he's the first person to ever use the phrase war on drugs way before Nixon, right? He used it in the 1930s, way before Nixon or Reagan. So Anslinger is a fascinating guy and was right about some things, interestingly, catastrophically wrong about the drug war. So Anslinger was a, a government bureaucrat. And he took over the Department of Prohibition just as alcohol prohibition was ending. So he takes over this big government department that's basically got enough. They've lost the war on alcohol and, you know, its future looks bleak. And Anslinger invents the modern war on drugs, um, partly to keep his department going. It's bureaucratic log rolling. He had previously said that cannabis was not a harmful drug. He suddenly announces it's the most evil drug in the world and it's causing people to commit murders and hack each other to pieces with axes. Literally, I'm, I'm not joking. Um, and 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 um, and he he effectively invents the modern drug war, and he builds it around two groups who he really intensely hates. Um, the first group is people with addiction problems. He he had lived next door to a woman with an addiction problem when he was a child. It really terrified him. Uh, and the second group was African Americans, Latinos, and Chinese Americans. I mean, this is a guy who was regarded as extremely racist in the 1920s in the United States. So it gives you some sense of how racist he was. His own senator said he should have to resign because he used the N-word so often in official memos. <laughs> he was unhinged. And I opened Chasing the Screen, really, and this is where the movie opens, I'm very excited to say. Um, and I'm so excited because I've seen the rough cut. And you know, I, 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 I knew Lee was a brilliant director and I'd obviously read the scripts a lot, but I'm so excited having seen it because I was shitting myself before I saw it. And he's done such a good job. And Andrew Day, who plays Billy holidays fucking incredible in it but um so um the, the the i open the book and the movie the movie opens with this this moment um so in 1939 uh billy holiday walked on stage in a hotel in midtown manhattan uh she wasn't even allowed to go through the front door they made her go through the service elevator because she was black and for the first time she sang a song uh, called Strange Fruit, um, which was, a lot of people will have heard it, it's a song against lynching. It's the idea that in the deep south, hanging from the trees, there's a strange fruit and it's the, the, the bodies of lynched African-American men. And um, this is a really incendiary, incredibly powerful song. Years later, someone called it the musical starting gun for the civil rights movement, right? This is a really bold thing to do, an African-American woman to sing, stand up at a time when most sing songs the most popular song at the time is called ps i love you right it gives you a sense of what it's compared to um and and billy holiday gets a warning from harry anslinger's agents they tell her stop singing this song and in some ways it might seem like an odd place to begin the book because you think well what's this got to do with the drug war it tells you so much about the drug war right <laughs> so billy holiday was the incarnation of everything harry anslinger hated for two reasons well three really she was a uh, black woman resisting white supremacy in extraordinarily brave ways. And she was a, she had a very bad heroin addiction um, for reasons not dissimilar to Marsha Powell. When, when Billie Holiday was, Billie Holiday had grown up in one of the poorest parts of the United States, part of Baltimore called Pigtown. When she was 10 years old, her, a, a man had come, a man called Wilbur Rich, who was 42, came and told her that he'd been sent by her mother and to come with him and he, he then raped her. Uh, he was sent to prison. She was punished much more severely. He was sent to prison for a year and a half. She was sent away. They said that she was a whore who had tempted him. She was sent to a convent uh, where they tormented her. 
Uh, they locked her in with dead bodies because they said she had a bad attitude and needed to learn how to behave. I mean, just the most dreadful abuse. She ran away to join her mother who was living in Manhattan. Um, her mother was working as a prostitute in a brothel. And um, her, Billie Holiday started working in inverted commas alongside her, her mother as a, a child prostitute. So she's being raped by strangers for money you know, at the age of 14, day after day, night after night. Anyway, in these circumstances where she's in terrible pain for obvious reasons, Billie Holiday starts to anesthetize herself initially with huge amounts of alcohol and then with other drugs, including heroin. Um, and um, when Harry Anslinger told Billie Holiday to stop singing this song, Billie Holiday said, in effect, fuck you, I'm an American citizen, I'll sing what I damn well please. And at that point, Anslinger resolved to destroy her. Um, and, and this is really the focus of the movie is, is, is a particular thing he did, which is Harry Anslinger hated employing African-Americans, um, but you couldn't really get a white guy to follow Billie Holiday around Harlem all day. It'd be kind of obvious. So he employed a, a, a guy called Jimmy Fletcher, who was what was known as a bag man. Uh, employed, Billy, uh, employed Jimmy Fletcher to follow Billie Holiday everywhere she went, document her drug use and bust her. He actually wanted to bust all jazz singers. He thought jazz was an evil, primitive African kind of music that was hypnotizing white people and making it possible for white people to fucking impregnate, for black people to fucking impregnate white people, which was his worst nightmare, right? Uh, and these are the, really the terms he used. I'm not, this is obviously not my language. Um, and Jimmy Fletcher followed Billie Holiday everywhere she went for two years. He danced with her, he got to know her, he documented her drug use. And Billie Holiday was so amazing that Jimmy Fletcher fell in love with her. And his whole life he felt really guilty about what he did next. He busted her, he arrested her, she was sent to prison. The trial was called the United States versus Billie Holiday and she said that's how it fucking felt. She's sent to prison for two years, she doesn't sing a word in prison. But then when she gets out of prison, uh, the cruelest thing is waiting for her, which is that to perform anywhere where alcohol was served, you needed something called a cabaret performer's license. And Anslinger makes sure that Billie Holiday doesn't get it. So as one of her friends, Yolanda Bavan said to me, they took singing away from Billie Holiday. Can you imagine a crueler thing to do? This, by the way, is what we do to people with addiction problems all over the world today, right? We, instead of um, helping them reconnect with the society. We put barriers between them and reconnecting. We give them criminal records, we shame them, we stigmatize them. In that situation, entirely predictably, Billie Holiday relapses. She collapses one day in midtown Manhattan, not very far from that night where she'd, she'd sung Strange Fruit, uh, eight, whatever it was, 16 years before. She's taken to hospital. The first hospital won't even let her in because she's um, got an addiction problem. Second hospital takes her. In the hospital, she's diagnosed with advanced liver cancer. She goes into heroin withdrawal. Um, one of her friends manages to insist that she's given methadone, at which point Anslinger's agents arrest her on her deathbed. They handcuff her to the deathbed. They don't let her friends in to see her. Um, she, she, she lies there. She's in a terrible state. Um, and Anslinger's men cut off the methadone and the next day she dies. Um, one of her friends said that she looked like she had been violently wrenched from life. Um, Harry Anslinger gloated for years afterwards about her death. He wrote in one of his books, there'll be no more good morning heartache for Billie Holiday. Incredibly, the DEA Museum in Washington DC, the Drug Enforcement Agency Museum, has on its wall a pic, this is the successor to Harry Anslinger's uh, Federal Bureau of Narcotics, the thing that grew out of it, has on its wall a picture of Billie Holiday boasting of that as one of their success stories. It's extraordinary. And that's the official drug war body in the United States. And there's so many things to me about that. It tells you, of course, the drug war all along was about persecuting minorities. It was all along. It was never about protecting people or any of those things. But also the thing I take most from the story about Billie Holiday and that I'm really thrilled is such an important part of the movie is, you know, the best stories we tell about people. So there's only one heroic story we tell about people with addiction problems in our culture, which is that sometimes they recover from their addiction. And that is indeed a heroic story. And if anyone watching this is in that position, I give you nothing but love and congratulations. You should be really proud of yourself. But that's not the only heroic story about people with addiction problems, right? Billie Holiday never stopped having an addiction problem, not for long. She was still a fucking hero. No matter what they did to her, no matter how these 
people brutalized her, she never stopped singing Strange Fruit. She would go to the worst parts of the Deep South where you didn't need a license and she would sing her song, you know? I remember, I didn't put this in the book, I'm annoyed with myself that I didn't. I, when I interviewed one of her friends, Yolanda Bavan, who's herself a great jazz singer, um, I said to Yolanda, if Billie Holiday, if you could speak to Billie Holiday now, what would you say to her? And she told me that towards the end of her life, Billie Holiday thought she'd be completely forgotten. No one would remember her. And she said, I would say to her, Billie, this morning I went into Whole Foods and they were playing your songs. Nobody forgot you, baby. And I just think, you know, when we're thinking about going forward, the work, the brilliant work you do, and so many people watching this do to resist the drug war, I think about, you know, all over the world, every day, people listen to Billie Holiday and it makes them stronger. And they listen, and all over the world, with a few exceptions like Portugal and Switzerland, we follow the script that was laid out by Harry Anslinger and it makes people weaker and sicker and it breaks them. And in a way, this struggle between Billie Holiday and Harry Anslinger continues and it's up to us and the activism we do to decide who will prevail. Thank, thank you so much for, for telling that story. And I think uh, a huge part of it, so one part that makes me very optimistic is that we have people, we just mentioned uh, Neil Woods, who was a former- Ah, oh, love uh, Neil. Actor who, who kind of uh, changed uh, his views completely, started writing books about how our approach to prohibition is wrong. Then we have the officer medics example that you have been talking uh, about in the book. So part of it is we obviously see there are some people who come into the other side of the system, they see how it works and then they realize what all of these fallacies. So um, I think she understands that the, the places that, that she in her career are sent to, to investigate are usually one type of neighborhoods, not any affluent neighborhood, but constantly prosecuting the, the, the same people. Um, what, what, if you can maybe spare a word or two on that, and why do you think that we still have a few people that we can point out, such as, again, Nil uh, and then uh, Officer for Medics and so on, but there's so many of them who are still maybe not seeing or not understanding that 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 those aspects what is your take on that yeah so i think you, that's a really good question so just people who don't know neil woods friend of mine amazing uh british guy who was a police officer who realized that he was actually terribly harming people by enforcing the drug war and quit and he's written a great book that everyone should read called good cop bad war um I think it's interesting because you've gone to, one of the things that does become clear to a lot of cops, not all, and I interviewed loads of cops for the book, is, is what I think is actually the most harmful aspect of the drug war, which is not what we do to users and people with addiction problems. Although I think you can tell that's close to my heart. I think it's monstrous. <clears throat> the biggest harm is something else entirely, which is the violence caused by prohibition. And I think it could be quite hard. It took me a while to get my head around this. And I think the... One well, of the best ways to explain it is kind of quite simply, which is just imagine that you or I in normal times, because of coronavirus, we can't, but in normal times, imagine you or I left our homes and decided to try to steal a bottle of vodka, right? We go into the shop, we take the bottle of vodka, we try to run out. That store will call the police and the police will come and arrest us. So the store doesn't need to be violent. It doesn't need to be intimidating. They've got the power of the law to uphold their property rights. Okay, now imagine in the countries that you're, we're currently in, Serbia and Britain, let's imagine we wanted to steal not a bottle of vodka, but a bag of cannabis or a bag of cocaine, right? Obviously, if we steal that, the people we steal it from can't call the police. The police would come and arrest them. They have to fight us, right? Now, if you're a dealer, and as I was taught by many of the dealers I got to know, um, you, you don't want to be having a fight every day, right? It's not a good way of doing business. You want to establish a reputation for being such a badass that no one be so stupid as to fuck with you by trying to steal your products, right? You do that by creating what one sociologist called a culture of terror. Oh, I've just realized that my laptop is going to run out of battery. Uh, hang on a second, I need to just plug you in or carry you across the room to do that. Um, yeah, so, you know, that, the, the, so the, the, as, um, and of course you establish your place in that neighborhood as a dealer, often through violence and intimidation, right? As Charles Bowden, a late writer said, um, the war on drugs creates a war for drugs, 
right? Um, and if, and if you want to know how much, and this is a staggering level of violence, I mean, I spent a lot of time in northern Mexico, in Colombia, in El Salvador, uh, reporting on this, and it's some of the most harrowing research I did for the book is those places. I mean, uh, if you look at the death toll just from northern Mexico, it's almost as high as the deaths in Syria, right? And if you want to know how much of this violence is caused by, not by the drug, but by the prohibition, just ask yourself, where are the violent alcohol dealers, right? Does, does the head of Smirnoff go and shoot the head of Heineken in the face, right? No, of course not. But exactly that kind of thing happened under alcohol prohibition. We all know who Al Capone was. Um, when did that violence end? It ended day one when alcohol was legalized again in 1931 or 32. Um, and, and there's a great guy at Harvard, Professor Jeffrey Myron, He's done a graph of this. He's a great guy for you to talk to if you want an intro. Uh, done a graph of this, right? Murder rate massively spikes up when alcohol is banned and falls like a stone when alcohol is legalized again. So the fact of prohibition is killing, it makes the drugs themselves much more dangerous to users and people with addiction, but it causes enormous numbers of deaths. And I think about the people I got to know, you know, I uh, spent time with a young hitman for the former hitman for the deadliest Mexican drug cartel at the time, Los Zetas, uh, Rosalia Reta. I think people will remember the scenes, you know, uh, horrifying scenes of people in public parks injecting in the neck, dying in the streets. And that would be terrible for any country, but for Swiss people who are obsessed with like order, it's not a coincidence they invented clocks. This is like horror beyond horror. And, you know, they tried their first instinct, which is to just punish people and shame people and arrest them and the drug war. And it kept failing. And, and, and Ruth, spurred, as she would tell you, by health activists and so on, local Swiss health activists, said to the Swiss people, in effect, this is not an exact quote, but it's the gist of what she said, I think the solution to this is to legalize heroin. And she said, I know when you hear that, it will sound crazy, but because when you hear the word legalization, what you picture is like anarchy and chaos. She said to people, what we have now is anarchy and chaos. We have unknown criminals selling unknown chemicals to unknown drug users, all in the dark, all filled with violence, disease, and chaos. She said, legalization is the way we restore order to this chaos. And, and, and of course, it's about reclaiming the drug from armed criminal gangs, bankrupting the armed criminal gangs. So the way it works in Switzerland, and I spent time in those clinics as a, as a journalist, I went to the one in Geneva, is um, if you've got a heroin problem, you're assigned to a clinic. I mean, you, there's a range of options you can choose, but one of them is you can be assigned to a clinic. You go to that clinic at seven o'clock in the morning because Swiss people believe in doing things insanely early, which is a constant argument between me and my dad. You, you go in, you're given your heroin there. It's medically pure heroin. Uh, you're given it for free. You can't take it out with you because they don't want you to resell it on the streets and they want to monitor you as you use it. <laughs> you uh, inject yourself or you can be injected by a nurse. And then you leave and you go to your job because you're given a huge amount of support to get housing, to turn your life around, to get therapy, um, all of which, by the way, is much cheaper than using the criminal justice system and imprisoning people. And this argument for order prevailed in Switzerland, not because Swiss people are so compassionate, they're really not, right? It prevailed because people could see that before they had chaos, and after this, street prostitution disappeared, the chaotic scenes in the parks disappeared, they saved money, um, and um, it's worth looking at the statistics from Switzerland, as Dr. Ambrose Uchtenhagen and others have, have shown, there have been zero heroin overdose deaths on the legal program in Switzerland since it began 16 years ago. Zero, not one person. More people have died of heroin overdoses in the United States since you and I started doing having this conversation that have died in all those years in Switzerland. And that um, there remains a small illegal market, but it has shrunk and shrunk and shrunk. And accordingly, overdoses in the illegal market have shrunk and shrunk and shrunk. Because who wants to buy shitty contaminated heroin from a dealer where you can get really good free heroin and loads of support and help? And one of the things that most surprised me about the Swiss program when I was there, remember the, the uh, psychiatrist who runs it, Dr. Rita Mangi, who I love, um, saying to me, you know, um, so on this program, they'll give you as much heroin as you want. You choose your own dose. They won't give you a dose that would kill you, but they'll give you any other dose. 
And you can stay on that dose as long as you want. There's never any pressure to cut back. But almost everyone does cut back over time and stop. And uh, I'm going to say, well, that, that doesn't seem right, right? What? Surely if they give it a free dose, they have this desperate physical craving, surely they'll just take it forever. And she said to me, like I was an idiot, which in many ways I was, well, we help them and their lives get better. And as their lives get better, they don't want to be anesthetized so much. And it's kind of obvious. So the reason I mentioned that about Switzerland is, actually, I think police officers, figures of authority are very good people to make the case for reform. This is why law enforcement against prohibition, which is a group of former law enforcement officers is so valuable. And I think a lot of police officers can see the case for order and for change, right? At the same time, a lot of them are very invested in the drug war. A lot of them have lost friends who've died. It's very hard to admit your friends died in a war that was completely pointless and actually made the world worse, right? So you can see the psychological mechanisms that kick in to get them to remain invested in it. But um, I think that case for order is a very powerful one to make for reform. Thank you, thank you for that. And um, kind of talking about reform. So you were you were writing "Chasing the Scream," I assume, in the first half of 2010s, right? It came out in 2015. And if if someone had had asked you at that time, what do you expect by 2020? And let's say you 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 just we are in 2020. Um, besides the the virus situation, what would you say? Have we managed to to do a lot in the past five seven years, or are we further the, from the goal than you than you thought we would be at, at this point? I think we've seen, this is not a slight cop-out answer, but I think it's the truth. We've seen some incredible progress and some incredible regression. So obviously the progress, you know, if you'd said to me when I started researching the book in 2011, there'll be whole countries that have legalized cannabis and not, you know, not just Uruguay, a country I love and spent time in, um, but, you know, Canada, right, a very lot, you know, if you told me that almost half of the states in the United States would have legal ha cannabis, I would have, that would have seemed to me like the jackpot, right? So we've had some huge progress. Cannabis legalization, you now have, but when Bill Clinton left office, doesn't seem so long ago, 15% um, of American citizens were in favor of legalizing cannabis. Today is 70%. So there's been a transformation in, on the question of cannabis legalization. Doesn't mean cannabis has been legalized in exactly the way I'd want, but even uh, flawed forms of legalization are much better than any form of prohibition, right? Um, I'm always, <laughs> when I was saying an argument with someone about this the other day on the phone and they were saying, you know, oh, we can't legalize because then, you know, drugs will be controlled by corporations. And I said, who do you think controls the drug trade now? Do you think the Zetas are like a not-for-profit, you know, are they an NGO, right? It's, it's, Pablo Escobar was a charity worker. What, you know, at the moment, it's controlled by the most dystopian possible corporations. So anyway, some progress um, on that from um, opinion is shifting on addiction, even just things as trivial as, this is a dumb example, but if you watch something like, uh, recently I was watching, uh, I've got a lot of insomnia at the moment because of coronavirus. I was watching an episode of Starsky and Hutch, right? The a cop show from the eighties. And a staple of shows like that, you see it often in lots of them, will be a cat, the evil addict character, right? It comes along, who's shown to the viewer to be an addict and therefore the reader will read that person as evil and will know that they're like scum who are just gonna steal everything and you know uh, have wicked motives, right? You would never get that in, a, in law and order now, right? It would be unthinkable. There wouldn't be an evil addict character. The audience would be, because public opinion has changed so much, right? We're much more compassionate to people with addiction problems. It doesn't mean the laws have caught up. They largely haven't, but there have been these transformations. At the same time, there's been some terrible regression. Uh, obviously the Philippines, uh, Duterte, if you told me you'd have an American president who was praising a Philippine president who literally said that he want, com proudly compared himself to Hitler and said he wanted to kill every addict in his country, um, I would have thought that was a pretty dystopian outcome. Uh, so there's some regression, you know, um, and the US is uh, uh, divided on these questions as it is on everything, it seems. Um, we, we still have terrible raging drug wars in Mexico. 
and in Latin America, I would have hoped we'd made a bit more progress on that. So I think it's very mixed bag. But I also think, yeah, I would have hoped there'd be more progress within Europe. I'm surprised that Europe has, uh, that European countries with the heroic exceptions of Portugal and Switzerland have not uh, have not been better. I'm surprised we don't have a European country that's fully legalized cannabis. I mean, sort of the Netherlands has, but that's very much a weird anomalous situation. A, a, a good one, but but it's not real legalization. Um, so I, I'm surprised that Europe has been so laggardly on this. Um, I'm surprised that Portugal is still out on its own in, in having been the only country to have decriminalized all drugs with incredible results. Um, so it's a mixed bag, but the future completely depends on on us, right? On the people watching your YouTube channel and your Facebook feed. You know, it, it completely depends on what 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 we do. If enough people at the moment, it's every politician in a democracy is constantly making a calculation. If I make a decision, how much praise will I get, and how much shit will I get, right? And generally. If the shit will massively outweigh the praise, they won't do it. Sometimes you'll have a heroic individual like Ruth Dreyfus, former president of Switzerland, who will lead public opinion, or uh, Pepe Mujica, who I interviewed, uh, former president of Uruguay, who'll really try to lead public opinion. That's rare, right? Mostly they'll make that calculation. So in the US now, actually, you'll, if you legalize cannabis, you'll get a little bit of shit, but a lot of praise. So the calculus has shifted and therefore most politicians have shifted, right? Um, even Trump has not sent in the feds to try and break up the states that have legalized. So, you know, uh, the calculus shifts. And every piece of work everyone watching this does that moves public opinion brings the day this war ends closer, right? So this is a really consequential fight. And, and, and it's a funny kind of fight because actually one thing that really strikes me, I'm often asked to go on TV to, you know, make talk about the kind of things we're talking about. And very often the producers will say to me, who can we get to be up against you because we can't get anyone to defend the drug war, right? The only people, there's a few people whose literal job is to defend the drug war, right? Uh, um, some of whom are quite nice people and some of whom I find pretty disreputable, but whatever, you know. Um, but basically the only people left standing who'll defend the drug war are people who make a living out of defending the drug war or fighting the drug war. That tells you something about how hollow this policy is, right? It's got very few defenders left. There are pe people are anxious about the alternatives, which is why we need to do a much better job of explaining what the alternatives actually mean in practice, which is why it's so important, I think, to not couch it as an abstract debate. But as like, let me tell you about Portugal, let me tell you about Switzerland, let me tell you about Colorado, let me tell you about Uruguay, let me tell you about Vancouver. Um, these real places where these things have actually happened uh, to differing degrees, obviously different models. But um, so I think it's funny, I think I feel very mixed about it, like so many things in the world that are up in the up in the air at the moment. And um and it's diff very difficult to game out how the fact that we're probably going into the, well, this appears to be the worst economic contraction in 300 years globally, how that's going to play out on these issues. I mean, it's worth remembering one of the reasons alcohol is legalized again in the United States in the late, by FDR is they needed the money. They needed the tax revenue, right? Like, it, 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 I mean, the war had failed, demonstrably failed, and it was unpopular. But also, if you look at, there's a very good history of this by Daniel Ockren. I think it's just called Prohibition. Fantastic history book. Uh, they needed the money, you know? And I do think we're going to be going into, we're going to need to raise tax revenue. And a very obvious way to raise tax revenue is to tax the cannabis trade, which is currently entirely untaxed. And all the money is going to criminals. Well, we can get some of that money for, you know, our public services and dealing with all the crises we're going to face now. I mean, to, to kind of, uh, we're getting closer to, to the end of the hour. I would say that um, I think there's there's some optimism and that there's definitely some hope that the Roaring Twenties will include the, some, some of the changes when it comes to both cannabis and other drug policies. And I think even though 420 is uh, specifically a cannabis day, I think many of the topics that we covered in, in, the, in the past hour are as applicable to cannabis as to the other, to the other substances. Um, when when is the movie coming out? 
You are... Well, because of the madness, everything's kind of postponed. Uh, so I don't know the date. Um, uh, it'll be next year, I'm guessing now, but because um, I don't think there's going to be any movie theatres for quite a while. But, um, but uh, you know, um, hopefully soon. Can I, uh, just to wrap up, can I tell you a story that's not in the book that I so I'm thinking about the last few days? Um, I might get a few of the details wrong, but not the gist of it. As a person, I would recommend you you talk to um, just for people who are watching and thinking about, you know, their ability to make a difference. And and you know, uh, I was talking to you before we went on air, and it's you know, you know, you're from Serbia. It's brave for you to take the stand. This is a difficult stand for you to take. And I always think when we're thinking about, uh, and I really admire you for it. And I think it's worth thinking about. How would I put it? thinking about these things in the long arc and when I do that I think about a, a, an incredible man named Dr Alex Wodak who's become my friend um, who a lot of people watching will without knowing it owe a huge debt to so Alex was a doctor in Sydney in an area called King's Cross which was a kind of notorious area at the time it was like if you think about the old Times square from the 70s or that gives you some impression a kind of grungy neighborhood um, and and he was one of the first doctors to kind of see AIDS arrive in the early 1980s. And it started, to, and King's Cross was one of the, in fact, I think it was the epicenter in Australia. And there was a lot of deaths and people getting sick. And Alex was a doctor and he, he um, quite quickly, well, they knew what to do with gay men, which was, they could see very quickly that it was particularly affecting two groups, gay men, and injecting drug users. And they knew what to do with gay men. It was to distribute condoms and do education. But at that time, no one knew what to do about injecting drug users. There had, there had never been any needle exchanges. Um, so Alex, there were a few people in the Netherlands who were having this insight around the same time, but Alex was one of the first people to go, well, we should just give them clean needles, right? And at the time, people said, this is a ludicrous idea, right? They'll, the addicts are out of it. They're not going to use the clean needles. They're not going to know how to do this. This is, this is you know, bullshit. Um, and it was a criminal offence in Australia to, to give out drug paraphernalia. But a coalition of people in King's Cross led by Alex, it was an incredible coalition of the local prostitutes and the local nuns <laughs> teamed up in an unlikely alliance to hand out needles. And they started doing this and they believed it might be having some effect. And of course, it was being scientifically monitored to see. So Alex is in charge of this and the police keep telling him, you have to stop doing this. This is a crime. You're not allowed to do it. You're facilitating drug use. You're helping junkies, as they would have put it. Stop. Alex said, no, I'm not going to stop. You know, his parents were Holocaust survivors. They had survived because people had broken the law in, in Nazi Germany. So no, I'm not gonna do it. And in the end, Alex was called in to see, I believe it was the health minister of New South Wales. And he was sitting there in a room with all these officials and the public health advisor and all the other people. And the minister said, Alex, you have to stop doing this or we will have no choice but to charge you criminally. You'll be arrested. You'll lose your medical license. You could go to prison. And Alex said, okay, arrest me, put me on trial. I'll explain to 12 ordinary Australians why I'm doing what I'm doing. You explain what you're doing and we'll see who prevails, right? And Alex walked out of the meeting and behind him in the elevator, the public health official got in and he whispered to Alex, whatever you do, don't stop. And that experiment in King's Cross along with the experiments that happened in the Netherlands were the first proof we had that needle exchanges massively reduced HIV transmission. We'll never know how many people's lives were saved by the heroic work that they stand that Alex and others took, right? But we know that because of that needle exchange spread all over the world, literally an incalculable number of people's lives have been saved because of course people who rejected drug users who've been saved would also have had sex with other people. It would have, we're talking about an enormous number of human lives. And I just think on this question, you know, You'll get a lot of pushback. You'll get a lot of people chatting shit about you. You'll get a lot of people, you know. I just think we have to think of people like Alex and so Billy Holiday and so many people throughout the hundred years, hundred and two years of this drug war now, more hundred and three, 
who've been brave, right? And, and we just have to be inspired by them and, 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 and stand up because even small steps of resistance can have a big effect further down the line in all sorts of ways. So just say Alex is still working. He's actually uh, pioneering and championing pill testing at Australian music festivals. He's, you know, must be in his 70s now and he's still doing cutting edge pioneering work. He's a fucking hero, Alex Wodak. Um, and yeah, I just think about people like them and we need to just look to them. I absolutely agree. Thank you so much. And I'm really glad that we're finishing this off on a very, very positive note. Oh, great. And I should say, because um, people have lots of time at home at the moment, if you want to listen to audio of any of the people we've talked about, loads of it is on the book's website. If you go to chasingthescream.com, it's scream as in like, ah, not scream. Uh, yeah, there you can listen to audio with uh, Billy Holiday's friends, with Bruce Alexander, who did the Rat Park experiment, with Marsha Powell's friends, um, with the Swiss president who we were talking about, with a huge range of people, the audio is there for free on the website. And you can take a quiz to see how much you know about the drug war and loads of other stuff as well. Absolutely. Please do that. Uh, also try to read the book. The book is absolutely amazing. If you are interested in the topic of the drug war, I'm absolutely sure you will enjoy it. Johan, thank you so much. I hope you will enjoy uh, the rest of the 420. Thank you so much for joining oh, me. Thank you for the amazing work you're doing. You should be really proud of it. Cheers. Really appreciate it. Thank you oh. and have a great day. Great. See you soon. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Bye.